Succes i veterinær praksis, podcast nummer 164. Hej alle sammen, velkommen til Dyrlæge Søren Pejstrup her. Hvis du er, har lyttet med før, så velkommen tilbage, og hvis du er ny, så velkommen til. Det her Succes Veterinær Praksis, det er et ikke så nyt projekt mere. Vi kører vel på syvende år nu snart. Det er et projekt, der hviler på tre ben. Den her podcast, som du lytter til nu, er det ene, hvor at målet er at gøre os alle sammen en lille smule bedre i veterinær praksis. Og det kan både være med faglige protokoller, med faglige standarder, men det kan også være eksperter fra andre brancher, som kan hjælpe os med forretningsgange, procesoptimering og stresshåndtering og den slags. Så podcasten er det ene ben. Det andet ben er sådan et e-mail nyhedsbrev, som vi sender ud måske 3-4 gange om måneden. Vi vælter der ikke med en masse spam e-mails om en hel masse, men vi fortæller dig, når der er gratis webinarer, og så får du protokoller og tips og tricks og sådan noget, som kan hjælpe dig i en travl hverdag i klinikken. Det tredje og sidste ben er nogle online-kurser, der ligger over på hjemmesiden. De har nogle specifikke læringsmål, så hvis du vil lære helt præcist, hvordan du udfører en neurologisk undersøgelse, så kan du lære det der. Du kan lære at tolke blodprøven i forbindelse med anemi. Du kan lære, hvordan du tolker finlodsaspirater af hudtumors. Og så ligger der nogle foredrag, som blandt andet er relevant for i dag, der handler om, hvad du kan få ud af et tandeftersyn. Og som lytter af podcasten her, så kan du få adgang til de her kurser helt gratis i fire uger. Hvis du kigger på sivp.dk-4 uger, så får du 4 ugers gratis adgang til de her kurser. Hvis du ser fornøjelse, hvis du ser fornuftig at blive ved med at være med, så trækker den selvfølgelig medlemskab efter en måned. Men hvis ikke, så melder du dig selvfølgelig bare ud igen, og så kan du tage med dig, hvad du har lært. Det var på sivp.dk-4 uger. Dagens emne handler om standarden for tandbehandlinger her i Danmark. Vi er efterhånden ved at komme til et punkt, hvor vi kan kræve mere af os selv og af hinanden, og det med tandbehandlinger lige at rense tænder, efterhånden ikke så meget af noget, man sådan lige gør, når man har patienten i narkose alligevel. Det er måske nok noget, klienterne efterspørger stadigvæk, både for at spare tid og penge, og måske også spare en narkose. Men efterhånden, som vi bliver klogere og kan se og finde flere diagnoser, så kræver vi også af os selv og hinanden, og nogle klienter kræver det også af os, at vi faktisk finder og behandler de her sygdomme. Men hvis vi ikke ved, hvor vi skal starte, og ved, hvad vi skal se efter, så er det måske for nemt at overse. Og så kan vi meget hurtigt ende i en dårlig sag, hvor vi faktisk lader en patient gå fra klinikken med sygdom, som vi burde have opdaget. Det er sådan cirka ideen med de her dentale guidelines, sådan som jeg har forstået dem, men Brooke Nimick, som har været hovedforfatter på de her verdensomspændende guidelines, han fortæller meget mere om, hvad der er i de her guidelines og baggrunden for dem. Der er meget at hente i dagens episode, så over til interviewet med Brooke. Hi Brooke and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So I've been following you for some time and I know you've been teaching some of the the Danish veterinarians uh, doing dental work. Before we start, I'd like a short introduction for those who don't know you. What is important people know about you? Okay. Well, um, a couple of things. I'm going to get rid of that so it doesn't make noise anymore. Um, i am a board certified veterinary dentist in both the European and American veterinary dental colleges. Um, so it, there's not very many uh, of us that have both. And, and just for, for your listeners, the reason that I have European um, status is I am licensed to work in Estonia. So that's something that not very many people know is that I'm a licensed veterinarian actually in Estonia too. And that's how I have the European um, diplomat status. Um, but I think one of the things that is not in the bio, it's not on the website, is that I spent five years um, as a general practitioner. Uh, I didn't just do internship residency and then um, and then you know ivory tower specialty. Um, I really learned in a pretty low income area of Southern California. So when I speak, um, it's one of those things that I 
know what it's like to be a general practitioner. I know what it's like to have the average client. Um, and then the other side of that is that I am still a practitioner, um, even though I speak and I write and all that kind of stuff, which is normally a university job. Uh, I spend my, I'm still a full-time practitioner. Um, so I, I know how to, I, I, we push the, the envelope um, by doing things in practice the way we do. So that's probably the most important thing is I am actually a GP at heart. So, and that's uh, good to hear because as soon as we talk dental work, it's some of it's something that most of us do or at least have some contact with. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are not all specialists, and we have to to manage some clients that don't want to get referred, or or we also have to manage some cases uh, in practice as well. So, not having to do the full uh, full on uh, uh, workup and CT scans every time is uh, is not uh, feasible so so having a more down to earth maybe uh, yeah. approach is is necessary for some cases exactly and you know you offer the best and you do what the clients will accept um you know i i when like i said when i was a general practitioner there were a lot of things that i did that Honestly, I had no business doing, um, but, you know, you go to the client, Hey, I don't know how to do this surgery on your bird, or I don't know how to, you know, do this. And, and the clients are like, yeah, but I'm not going to the specialist. So do the best you can. So at least you've offered the best. And, you know, from a medical legal standpoint, you're covered. So yeah, we, we offer the best and then we do our best. Yeah. Okay. So you authored or co-authored uh, some guidelines on dental work. And this um, it came into my radar when the um, the global um, veterinary conference was in Copenhagen a couple of years a uh, couple of years back. Um, I can see you have updated the guidelines since then as well. But um, I'd like to talk a little about these guidelines more than specific uh, a specific dental disease. I'd like to uh, I'd like to more talk about dental work from a more a broad perspective but um as a, as an author of this paper i'm guessing you think it's important but um and i do dental work as well so i think also it's important but maybe you can tell us uh, why it is important why is it uh, necessary to have um, guidelines in this topic Well, I mean, that's a multifactorial answer. Um, you know, the big thing is why let's, let's tackle the first thing. Why is, um, why is dentistry important? And then we'll talk about why the guidelines are important. It's somewhat related. Um, but the reason that dentistry is important is because, um, it, it is a painful thing and it is a systemic infection thing. Um, so when we talk about, um, dental disease, It is, and this came out of the guidelines as well, to a certain extent, um, dental disease is by far the number one problem in pets today. Um, studies, current studies, new studies, um, using good diagnostics finds that 90% of um, dogs have gum disease by just a year of age. So literally 90% of your dogs have gum disease. And the study from the 70s um, said 80%, but I think that because we've got small dogs now, um, because dogs are living longer, um, we have better diagnostics. Um, we're finding that that 80% at three years of age was under diagnosing it. And so it's likely higher with cats because there's no current studies with cats, but the one um, that was from the 80s said 70%. So I'm going to say that 80% to 85% of cats have some degree of gum disease and 90% of dogs have some degree of gum disease. So that means that almost every pet that comes into your practice every day has gum disease. Um, and then further studies, 10% of dogs have a fractured tooth in their mouth. Um, 50% of dogs um, have a, what's called uncomplicated crown fractures or dentin exposure, um, which is, again, painful, can be infectious. And, and that doesn't even include, you know, you talk about brachycephalics, they all have a malocclusion with trauma, um, you know, and, and, you know, stomatitis and enamel hypoplasia and, 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 you know, the thing goes on. The bottom line is that every pet that comes into your practice every day has a dental problem. They all do. And the unfortunate thing is, is that they are in pain. And they are infected quite often. Um, and so unfortunately, 90% of the patients that walk into your practice walk right out with no therapy. And the problem is that we just don't recommend it. And we also don't recommend it early enough. Um, you know, and one of the big things that I'm trying to uh, get out there is that we need to move more to preventative care. 
Um, so from a preventative care standpoint, you know, we go, we hope <laughs> we go to the human dentist every six months. Uh, we brush and floss our teeth. Um, you know, as veterinarians, we recommend senior panels. We recommend, um, you know, uh, annual exams, uh, you know, on the human side, you know, mammograms and PSAs and, and, and cancer screenings, colonoscopies, all that stuff. It's all preventative care. Unfortunately, worldwide in dentistry, it's all you know, wait for disease to be there and treat it. It's reactive. And I'd like to push this a little bit more to getting more prevention done as opposed to um, things. So that's really the big thing. The big thing we talk about dentistry, why is dentistry important to do? Um, it's because it's the most common problem out there by far. Um, and it does cause pain and infection, um, but there's usually no clinical signs. So patients suffer in silence. It's a huge welfare issue. Um, and so the more that we do dentistry, the more that we get rid of it. And one of the things that we're doing uh, that I'm doing currently is looking at a study um, where we have a blinded person that's looking at um, behavior before and after a client. Um, clients are filling out a uh, survey and saying, this is how my dog's eating. This is their activity level, blah, blah, blah. And then how is he feeling today? And then in a month they get another one and then they do that. Like, how's he feeling today? And, and just like if you do dentistry, you know, you hate the animals. Oh my God, it's a whole new dog. Um, yet if the client came in that first day, they're like, well, he's fine. I don't know why I'm doing this. Um, but then two weeks later, they're like, oh my God, it's a whole new dog because the dogs are telling them they don't feel well. They, we just don't understand their language. No, I, I've have, uh, I've have had owners telling me the same thing as well, but I'm, I've been thinking how much is that, uh, something they read into the situation because they, they just paid the, uh, right. uh, not a small amount of money uh, to have the, the dogs, uh, undergo, undergo uh, surgery. So they will likely uh, look, be looking for something positive. Yeah. And it's the placebo effect too, because you tell them they're going to feel better. That convinces them to do it. And then they do. And that's why, you know, with the study, what we're looking at is, you know, we, some of the animals that are, that are in the study just had a cleaning. And so you wouldn't expect them to feel better. Um, some animals had major work and you would. Um, and so the person that's putting this together is blinded. They don't know what was done. So we're looking to see, you know, are these pets coming in with just a cleaning or just like a sealant or something um, and having miraculous, um, you know, changes. If that's the case, then we have to rethink the fact that, well, maybe they don't feel any better. It's actually a placebo effect. Um, give us a couple of years. We'll get there. Mm, okay, good. So, <laughs> so um, um So I get it. It, it, it. Most of my patients have uh, some kind of dental or oral disease, but why are guidelines important here? Um, great question. The reason that guidelines are important, is, there are many reasons. Um, the main reason is because veterinary dentistry is still not taught in school. Um, you know, in the U.S. and actually the the United States or the ABMA just um, literally last year, I think, um, mandated some dental education in vet school. I mean, really, <laughs> it's the most common thing. And it's something that vets do literally their first day in school. So the unfortunate thing about it is that, you know, the people that run vet schools are typically older um, and they typically were in practice or in, in the university when there was no dentistry, it wasn't, in, you know, wasn't seen as important. And so they don't, perceive it as something that needs to be taught. Um, yet when you get out in practice, it's one of the first things you do. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I've talked to them and they're you know, some of the deans and they're like, what do we not teach? Do we not teach cardiology? Do we not teach this? I'm like, well, the answer is you don't treat, um, teach pigs and horses and stuff like that to people that are going to be small animal, but it's, that's a whole nother op thing. The main reason that guidelines are necessary is because plain and simple, no one gets, not no one, most people don't get dentistry in vet school. So they come out in from vet school and they go to work for a practitioner that's been out 30 years and then didn't get any dentistry 30 years ago. And so all these myths and misconceptions and, you know, improper therapy is just cycled through. Um, and so the guidelines, um, you know, number one, they're educational. They're a hundred pages. It's basically a, a, a basic textbook, if you will. Um, And it's uh, it's basically it's it lays out 
the common things that are out there, like we just talked about how you treat them, uh, but it also gives minimal uh, equipment lists and it's tiered by the different country. I mean, obviously, you know, where you guys are at is, is a pretty high, you know, a, a pretty high end country. So you got to have the best, you're in, you're in, you're in, you know, the tier three, so you got to have the best, um, but there's other countries that can't. Um, and so those, that's the other thing is it creates those minimum standards and is it a legal minimum standard? No, but it's minimum standard. And then the last thing that's really nice, uh, for us, and obviously, you know, you're the people that are listening to this, you know, understand English, but not everyone does. And unfortunately, um, most, um, textbooks are not translated into Spanish or, you know, French or German or whatever. Um, and especially in Spanish speaking countries, there's very minimal textbooks out there. Um, and so the Basava has a, um, a translation committee and the guidelines have been translated into, I think, six languages now. Uh, I know French, I know Spanish, I know Mandarin. Um, so it gets a more global thing out there. And so by raising up the minimum standards, we're just going to raise everybody's understanding of dentistry. Can you talk uh, more about those? Yeah. Um, you know, again, because these are global guidelines, um, dentistry, well, veterinary medicine, so, you know, social economic stuff is different in, you know, every country. Um, and then the interesting thing about this is that there are in areas of the country, there are differences in the social economics as well. I mean, you know, especially in a country like the United States, I mean, we have areas that You know, we're in San Diego or in Las Vegas, or Los Angeles. I mean, it's hugely, you know, most people, you know, the area is very high income, but then there's areas of the U.S. that's very low income, but it's more from a global standpoint. Um, there is a thing, the World Bank basically has created this, these different levels and it's tier one, tier two, tier three, and then tier one is the, you know, the, the lowest of, uh, of low income. Um, and then tier two is, is in the middle and tier three is obviously, um, you know, Denmark and Germany and, and the UK and, and America and Canada. Uh, and so what they've done is they've come, we, we, we got the, the guidelines committee, which we got diplomats from as many places as we could. So there's a diplomat, there was a diplomat from South America, um, from Brazil, a diplomat from Africa, a diplomat from Australia, uh, Europe, and then America. And then, and so they could go and say, well, in, in Zimbabwe, say, or in, you know, in Peru, you know, this is kind of the level that they're at. And so we basically took these different tiers and said, okay, if you're a tier one country that, I mean, pretty much you're lucky to see a patient that's a small animal, um, this is kind of what you need to have. Um, if you're a tier two country, um, this is kind of what you need to have. And then if you're tier three, well, you got, you got it. This is what you need to have. And so it, it makes it more realistic for people rather than coming out like the AHA dental guidelines say, or FICAVA dental guidelines, they would come out and say, well, heck, we're all here. So we've all got to have this. It's like, well, that's not going to work in, in many other countries. So, um, but most of Europe, especially Western Europe um, is all tier three. And so they all need to have dental x-rays and they all need to have, you know, sterilized um, packs and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a nice equipment list that lists it out. Um, you know, and again, is this a legal thing? No. Um, some of the tier two and tier three countries though, that don't have strong, um, Uh, what's what I'm looking for, associations or boards, um, they have actually adopted the, the Wasava Dental Guidelines as their minimum standards, which was kind of nice. They at least mm -hmm. gave them something that they could go to their board with and go, dude, we need to do this. We need to do it better. And they have. Yeah. So what I also hear you say is that uh, you and the guidelines actually expect more from, from us or from, from me or from the, the Swedish or Norway, Norwegian vets listening to this. Absolutely. Now, again, if you're way above the Arctic Circle in Norway, you probably don't have the clientele that you would have in Oslo or of in um, Sweden. And, I, and you know, and I and, and the other thing that, from what I understand, um, in in Scandinavia, um, you guys have really, really good pet insurance, um, and your 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 clients quite often have it. I know in Sweden, they they almost all of them are insured. Is that is that correct? Yeah, well, um, more in Sweden than we have here in Denmark, as I'm uh, is what I'm hearing. But the Danish um, insurance don't cover dental work unless it's traumatic. 
Uh, so there issue. is one one uh, company that uh, where you can and can have an add-on insurance that covers uh, mostly everything, uh, but you would have to pay extra for that. Uh, and thereby, the the owner have to be more aware that this uh, could be an issue. And usually, it's uh, if they have had a dog previously with a lot of uh, dental disease, they will uh, have an insurance insurance moving forward. But I don't see a lot of those. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate because, you know, I have, I have a friend that practices in Sweden and she's just like, oh my God, it's amazing because they all have insurance and they just walk in and whatever, whatever needs to be done is all insured. Um, and in America, we, we have the same thing that you guys have. I mean, we have a decent number of people that are insured, but again, unfortunately, it doesn't cover preventative care and it doesn't cover periodontal disease, which is what they need to cover. But I think the, the insurance companies are smart enough to realize that it's going to get really expensive if they mm. if they don't do that. And I really think that that's where we talk about we need to do more prevention. And um, you know, and unfortunately, we we just don't. And that's you know, it's a it's an issue with you know anesthesia. People are afraid of anesthesia. Um, it's a cost thing. Um, but you know, it, life is a risk benefit ratio. And anesthesia nowadays, and that's the other thing that's in the guidelines. Um, it, anesthesia is ridiculously safe. I mean, nowadays, if you do it correctly um, and monitor it correctly, you know, it's, they, sh- they generally do great. Yeah. So, but, and we've talked about this in one of the previous episodes. So I talked to one of the Danish uh, dental veterinarians uh, that, um, Anesthesia is here and now and somewhat acute danger (laughs) and dental disease is more spread out over years and uh, might be more difficult. And you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but might be more difficult than anesthesia in the long run if you don't do anything. Absolutely. And, you know, and unfortunately, um, you know, people have a very... um, a very twisted uh, opinion of anesthesia because, you know, they're relating it, you know, to stuff that, well, there's two, two parts of this. Number one um, is that, you know, yes, 30, 40 years ago, anesthesia was pretty sketchy, you know, when I, when it was halothane and it was, you know, telazole or stuff like that, it was, it was pretty scary. Um, you know, and we weren't doing preoperative testing. And so you, you had more, you did have anesthesia tests. You did. Um, Nowadays, you know, again, in in developed countries, in, you know, practices where they monitor effectively, it's ridiculously safe. Um, And I I think the other side of it is the fact that, you know, people and and it's it's and I'm not sure what it's like in Denmark, but in the United States, um, you know, there is an increased um, that's what I'm looking for. There is an increased risk with dental procedures than with other surgeries. I do believe that's true because most people um, have that. And but the, it's not because it's a dental procedure. Um, there's a couple reasons, in my opinion, um, why people have a specific fear to dental anesthesia. Um, and one of them is the fact that um, we're typically treating older pets. It's fairly rare if you think about it from a general practitioner standpoint to do anesthesia in a 14, 15 year old dog for any other reason. Um, if they're needing cancer surgery or something like that, they're, they're typically going to a surgeon, um, but GPs are doing dentistry. And so they're doing it in older pets. Um, the other thing is it's incredibly rare to have surgeries that are more than, you know, and again, unless it's going to a surgeon anymore. Um, but like, you know, anything over an hour is going to be long. I mean, you might sedate an animal to do a lump removal or a laceration or something like that, or ear cleaning, but you're not doing thing. And I hear all the time and it drives me crazy to hear, well, yeah, we did a three hour procedure. Why? Well, mm-hmm. because it took an hour to get the x-rays done. Well, it's just lack of training. So that's one of the big things is, is, is time under anesthesia too. But if we do things right, they, they really actually do quite well. And I tell clients all the time, if, you, if everything's done correctly, anesthesia wise, and they're worked up, et cetera, et cetera, um, age is not a disease. It's, it's a natural consequence of not dying. Um, you know, they get older, you know, and that, yeah. that, that actually comes from our anesthesiologist, our anesthesiologist is like, dude, I, and again, and if you think about it, if you guys are out there long enough, it, it, puppies are miserable under anesthesia. They have low blood pressure. They, they're all over the place. Whereas old dogs, you give me an old dog with heart disease, they just want a nap. And so you just give them a little drugs and they just go. So I tell clients all the time, you know, life is a risk benefit ratio. It is, you, you I mean, drinking this cup of coffee, that milk may be bad. 
but I'm just going to drink it. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the most dangerous things that we do every day is get in a car and drive. Yet we get in a car and drive every day because the benefit of getting to the store or getting to work outweighs the risk of dying. Um, and the, and so when you talk about um, when you talk about anesthesia and dentistry, the 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 benefits of oral care so far outweigh the minor minor risk of anesthesia um, that it just it, it it can't be overstated that it's it's well worth it. And then again, we talk about you know prevention, and and when you do prevention, you do a forty five minute procedure once a year, as opposed to mm-hmm. waiting for four years and then doing a four hour procedure, you have to extract all the teeth. And so the costs kind of yeah. work out to be the same too. Um, over, over the years, it's, you know, we have an old commercial in the U S pay me now or pay me later. Um, and, and it, it really works out well to do the preventative care. Uh, and there are some, and I'm not sure in, in Denmark, if you have, um, you know, the, the, the corporate chains coming in buying veterinary yeah, practices. Yeah, we have one here in the United States, um, and it's not, you know, it's it, it's within a pet um, a, a pet store. It's called Banfield, and it's corporate, and it's a chain, and it's box, and it's you know standard. Well, the one thing they have, which is really actually kind of nice, um, is they do have a healthcare plan. Um, so they basically you pay. I don't know how much it is, but you pay, and every year you get um, you know a, an exam or two a year. You get a blood test every year. And you get a dental cleaning every year as part of the package. Um, and the nice thing about this is, as I talk to my friends that actually work there, because it's a huge business here. Um, and they're like, you know what, Brooke? We don't see those disaster cases that you see and everyone else sees because the clients come in every year and get the teeth cleaned. Um, yeah. And so we just don't see that. And so I think at some point, you know, some way, we as a profession need to, to do that. We need to start creating these more healthcare plans where, where we clients just pay every year. And, you know, it's like a, a subscription based thing. Um, and that way I, it kind of takes away that thing. Cause we all have it for our, our human dental too. I mean, we do, and I'm sure you guys as well, where you have insurance for it and they, they cover the cleaning every year and they, they, and if you do it, then you get a discount on any fillings or extractions that you need. So um, yeah, prevention is critical. Yeah. We had uh, a couple of years back um, um, a f- chain selling uh, pet foods, um, hiring uh, some veterinarians and do uh, booster shots and and dental cleaning uh, in the the store um, for and and we had one close to where I work uh, and doing dental cleaning for half the price that I charge for it and of course we <laughs> we, had, uh, we were. Uh, uh, Um, going bonkers over it but yeah. um uh, it it might not be a bad thing uh, or am i um, hearing you wrong what's that uh doing dental cleaning just for just cleaning the teeth for a cheap price and then be done with it uh, every year oh i think it would be amazing i mean it would be great to do that um you know again the challenge comes down to when you're doing things cheaply is what's the quality Um, you know, and in in the world, you get what you pay for. And if you do it well, and you can do it inexpensively because you know you're you you're you know doing a high volume. But if you're still doing it well, then yeah, I think that's great because you know you're doing the prevention. And if, and if you really think about um, you know doing a cleaning on a on a dog that isn't a you know a disaster mouth movement. It doesn't take that long, um, and anesthesia is relatively inexpensive to do. I mean, a catheter, propofol, stuff like that. If you're taking digital X-rays, they're kind of free almost. Um, so you really can do it fairly inexpensively. I think the problem that comes down to it when you're trying to do it inexpensively means that you're trying to do a lot of them. And so if you're trying to do a lot of them, that probably means you're not doing a really good oral exam. But if if you figure out a way that you do a good oral exam and you do x-rays and you do a good cleaning, yeah, I mean, if you could do that, it's not that it's not that expensive to do. Um, and it keeps that animal healthy because it doesn't allow that disease to be there because unfortunately that 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 disease is there. And I guess that that also kind of leads us into the other thing. And that's home care. Um, you know, on the human side, and I talk about this all the time on the human side, home care is more important than professional care. If you, they showed that if you brush your, if you get your teeth cleaned every six months, but you don't brush them, getting your teeth cleaned is almost worthless. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't help. 
Um, and so that, because that progression, there was a study not too long ago that showed that bacterial counts come back within weeks of having a cleaning. So, and gingivitis comes back in two weeks as well. So if you guys are out there doing cleanings every year, or, you know, again, let's, let's say in a utopic world, we all have a pet that gets their teeth cleaned every year. But if the client's not doing home care, that pet is still infected 50 weeks a year. So it's a low grade infection, but it's still an infection. Whereas if you institute some kind of home care, ideally it's brushing, but there's tons of treats and, and, and diets and stuff out there. If the client does some kind of home care, then in that situation, you're going to decrease gum disease much more. Um, and like my hygienist says, the more you do, the less I have to do. Um, and so, <laughs> it, you know, if yeah. you guys are doing home care and if you got a client that's like, well, I can't afford it, or I'm afraid of anesthesia or blah, blah, blah. Toothbrushes are cheap and just getting the client to do it. But again, you need to start young. And that's the challenge is no one talks to these little three pound, you know, two kilogram, you know, dogs that are out there and, and they'll come in for their well puppy exam. You got to talk to them about the dental part because they're genetically prone to it. They're going to get horrible disease. So if you can start earlier, it's better. Yeah. So, and you mentioned um, x-rays twice now. So we have to talk about that as well, because okay. uh, the the pet shop I was mentioning in uh, the, um, the offer that they, they were giving the cheap price there didn't include x-rays. So this was only uh, doing the cleaning. Yeah. Um, well, and and that was, uh, yeah. Well, that was that was uh, one of the <laughs> arguments against it, uh, and and yeah. why I was uh, uh, irritated that that yeah. maybe some owners uh, feel that they have done the right thing, but um, maybe they haven't. But I'd like you to talk it a little bit uh, how it, um, what you're thinking is: is it okay to do dental work without X-rays at any point? Oh. Um, no, well, yeah, yes and no. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's okay. No, I, well, and again, we, we come down to, um, you know, gold standard care versus care. Um, and, and one, and this, there's, there's a couple ways to talk about it. Number one is the strictly scientific side of it. Um, there's several studies done mostly by Verstrati, um, that basically say you miss a whole lot of pathology um, without x-rays. I mean, there, there is the, if you look it up and look at Bristrati FJR, um, and you look at the two, they did full di uh, value of diagnostic full mouth diagnostic, uh, x-rays in dogs and cats, um, two different studies. And it was like, you know, almost half the time you found something that was important. Um, I specifically find stuff more in small breed dogs and cats. Um, I tell people all the time, small breed dogs and cats, you can't do dentistry without it. I don't find as much with large breed dogs that I'm not expecting, um, but cat, dogs, small dogs and cats all the time. My resident, his thing, his thing to clients, and this is again, anecdotal, it's not published, but he says on a wake exam, you find 25% of pathology. When you anesthetize the patient and do an oral exam, you find 50% of the pathology. And then the last 25%, you can only find with dental x-rays. So from a, if you have a practice that's not doing any uh, therapeutics other than a clean, so I'm just going to clean the teeth. Well, the problem is that, <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this a long time and it's, we have residents in our, um, in the ABDC, the dental college, you have a, uh, a list of cases that you must do. Like you need to do 35 root canals. You need to do some of the things. Well, one of the things that they need to do is 20 cleanings, just straight cleanings that don't have any pockets or don't have anything else. And our residents are always, and we do 20 cases a day. And our patients, we throw out all of our practices. Our patients are like, did you find a routine profi? Did you find a routine profi? It's like, oh my God, we found one. So I put it in here. And because they don't exist, because again, we're not doing those preventative care. So my question would be in that situation when you've got, a, we only do cleanings. Well, but then you're not treating the disease that's there. Um, that, that I think is wrong. Um, you have to be prepared for doing extractions and other things. So if you're just doing cleanings, part of the cleaning, and this is what a lot of veterinarians or a lot of, well, not of vets, but really most clients don't understand. 
the most important step of cleaning is cleaning underneath the gun. The second most important step of cleaning is the oral exam because of what we find. And I will tell you that 75% of the time when I do a, dent, a dental procedure, what we find on the oral exam under anesthesia and x-rays is more important than what they came in for. And they'll come in for a broken tooth and we'll find an oral mass, or they come in for a cleaning and we find a broken tooth. So the oral exam and the x-rays are absolutely critical to the diagnostic part. You would never go to your, your, your dentist and not have them take x-rays because there's just so much information that you're going to find. Um, and I can't, and, and then again, if you're going to do extractions, you, you've got to, you've got to have x-rays. And yes, I know that, you know, that that tooth needs to come out. It's loose. It's broken. It's discolored, whatever. But you have no idea what the roots look like. I mean, it could have extra roots. It could have curved roots. It could have ankylotic roots. It could have no bone at the bottom of the jaw. So they're they're, they're in 2022. If you're in Denmark, you got to have dental x-rays and you have to use them. And you can't just have them hanging on your wall because the information that's there is just, it's just, uh, it's impossible to do your job without them. Yeah. And that's in the guidelines as well, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. digital, um, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, you know, a draconian, you must have digital x-ray because standard film sucks or whatever. Yeah. Standard film isn't as diagnostic, but like, it's much less. It's just a pain. Um, dental x-rays are just, I mean, with their digital, they're so fast and they, they, they're, they're so easy to share. Um, yeah, I, yeah. everyone, everyone listening to this podcast should have dental x-ray plain and simple. And, and it's, it's not that expensive to get here as well. Uh, when we compare all, all the machinery we can buy, it, it's not, the uh, it's, it's not very expensive and you can actually have a return on investment on, on that. Right. And, and it, it will also level up the, the complete practice just because you can, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, and I, that you can do. Yeah, and, and I can say one other thing about it. And you talk about the cost, the financial aspect of it. Um, <laughs> interestingly, I, years ago when I was lecturing at Western um, in Las Vegas, I did a small group on radiology interpretation, and I had these three vets come in um, for it two years in a row, and they were from the Bay Area, so the San Francisco area. And we talked about it and they're like, okay, Dr. Nemec, we'll buy dental x-ray. And so they went back and they came back a year later and they said, well, you know what, Dr. Nemec, we, we did buy it. And what we decided to do was to give it away to the clients. And we told our clients, we're going to take dental x-rays because um, we just got it, right? We want to learn how to use it. We want to learn how to read it. We're not going to charge for it, but you need to pay for everything that we find. So if we find an infected tooth on the x-rays, you can't decline it because I'm giving you the x-rays and the clients were like, and they said, all of our clients were like, yeah, we're in, that's fine. And so they're like, we're going to do this for three months for three months. We're going to do this. And then we're going to start charging for it. They got out to three months and they're good friends. They're not, you know, they don't share, but they, they're good friends. They talk, they're not, they're not business partners. And they all went, came back at the three months. And they're like, we are making so much money doing this. <laughs> and we are making such a difference in our animals' lives. We're going to keep doing it. And they, they don't charge for their dental x-rays. They just charge for what they find. And the pathology that they find, the guy said, it's amazing how much, not only income that we make, but how much better we make the patients feel. And I think that's at the end of the day, we can talk about all this kind of stuff, but the bottom line is that it's better patient care. Yeah. So I'm not an owner of any clinic. I'm just employ an employee, right? So what really hurts me the most is not knowing if I let a patient go with the disease. If if the, the patient has disease and I didn't find it and I actually had the opportunity to do so, that that yeah. is, um, I don't like that. Um, and, and I don't care as much um, about the... Um, the money side of things, yeah. but that is also an, an argument that that's, um, or maybe it's more an excuse, but, uh, in the beginning, uh, when the, the nurses was frustrated and, uh, I didn't, I didn't teach them well. And it took like maybe 30 minutes to do the, the x-rays. It, it's, it's, it, you don't make any money because, and, and the anesthesia time is longer. And, and, um, I had, um, and, and it is an excuse because I can just, uh, 
look an up and an online course and look in, in in a book and and find find it so the solution was that i actually got one of my old um, study friends uh, study pals to and he's he's not a a specialist in in dentistry, but he's very interested in it. And I got him to show how he's, he's doing it. And, and just for fun, uh, I start timing us. uh, And with this, the most skilled nurse and me, we got down to six minutes. Mm -hmm. And, and it was actually when we were done with the x-rays, it's, we were at that point where the propofol is not, is uh, leaving the body and the, uh, the, the anesthesia is so yeah, much yeah. there unbalanced. Mm-hmm. So we were actually, uh, not, um, not too far behind, uh, from other anesthesia where you have to do, you have to clip the fur and you have to yeah. uh, do cleanings. And, and, and we were actually, uh, on with the, the dental work before, you would be uh, on with a, a regular surgery. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it takes some practice and it takes some um, interest, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's, it takes training and it's, and again, I tell people all the time, it, it, it's not rocket science. Dentistry is actually really simple. It really is. Extracting lower canines is miserable, but for the most part, yeah. dentistry, <laughs> you know, you don't, I'm not that smart. I tell people all the time, I was a very average veterinary student. Um, but I write books and I, I lecture and that's really why I know most of the things I know. Um, and it really comes down to, you can take any x-ray in the mouth of a dog or cat or almost with three angles. I mean, it's the, the mandibular cheek teeth are, are, you know, a 90 degree air angle, the maxillary cheek teeth are 45 and then the incisors are 20 and it, incisors and canines are 20. It's really simple to do. Um, it just takes practice and, 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 and some training. And there is, um, you know, you talk about training and options and stuff like that. I am doing, I please, I think it's called IQ or something. There is actually a Danish group that I am doing some virtual training with. Um, and it really, it was fascinating because with COVID, right, you can't go or you mm-hmm. couldn't go. Um, and so they started this thing where they're actually like using high end video to like video people doing the procedures and then then basically having somebody monitor that. And I do the radiology part of it. Um, so that's, you know, that's one option for training that's out there. But yeah, like you said, there's a lot of stuff online. We have, I have an online course. Um, that's a, a, what I call a, a, a virtual lab that I, instead of having people come in to the training center, which actually it's really funny because as soon as we finish this, I'm going to go to a training center because yeah, it's coming back. Um <laughs> <laughs> but we we recorded instead of me demonstrating to the people like this is how you do it. I just had a guy come in and video it, and so it's really up close, high end video. These things exist everywhere, um, and and you can get the training without having to go someplace. Um, but there's coming back the options to do things as well. Yeah. So um, communication is one thing, and X-rays is another thing that is in the the guidelines. Yeah. Um, maybe I, I know there's a, a lot more in there, of course. Um, but is there one more thing that you feel is important that we should uh, two more? Okay, two more. <laughs> there's two, two more. more things that I think they're that are that are really and they're related. Um, because in the guidelines, there's also we talk about anesthesia. So there's a whole thing about that's written by a boarded anesthesiologist, uh, anesthesia pain management. So there's so there's that's that's part of it. But the related part is number one. Um, and this is, this is the big heart. This is the big why, um, we got all these people together. And, um, when we wanted to start, this is a quick story, um, because we don't have a lot of time left, but quick story. Um, I wanted to, my friend, Jerzy Gabor, who's in Poland, he's the one that kind of, it was his brainchild and we put it together together and we wanted to do these guidelines. So we, we took it to the Wasava dental, dental, uh, executive board. And again, these guys are surgeons, they're whatever. And they're like, dentistry, eh, whatever. Um, and so we, we started, you know, I don't get it. Of course, most dentists are crazy passionate um, because we see the difference that we make. And so I remember I was sitting in with the president of the uh, president elect of Wasava. I was in Toronto with him um, in this backyard with, <laughs> with a glass of scotch and a cigar, which is where a lot of good things happen. Um, and we were chatting and we went through this whole thing. He's like, well, Brooke, you know, guidelines are expensive. You're going to have to get sponsorship. It's going to take a lot of work. And for Wasaba to, to bite off on doing these guidelines, you know, you're going to have to really convince us, right? 
And so I, he, and I said, all right, here we go. Let's do this. And I went through this whole thing. And by, after 10 minutes of me just blah, 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 talking, just like we just talked about, he looked at me and he said, you know what, Brooke? Yeah, I think you should do them. Um, and he's like, you know what? Based on what you're telling me, un and undertreated dental disease is an animal welfare concern. And it is. It truly is an animal welfare concern. So if you read the dental guidelines, there is a section written by a welfare scientist about the welfare aspects of un and undertreated dental disease. So to me, as a veterinary dentist, that was the most exciting thing to come out. If there's one thing that I could get rid of in my career, one thing, it would be anesthesia for dentistry um, because it, it, everyone thinks that it does this great job because the teeth look clean. But remember the surface of the teeth, and we, this isn't a whole perio talk, but you've got to clean underneath the gum line. If you're not cleaning underneath the gum, you're not doing anything medical for your patient. Um, and so anesthesia-free dentistry, what it does is it, it scrapes the surface of the teeth, but doesn't get down underneath the gum. So it is stressful. It is painful um, for the patient. Um, they don't like it done. But the big thing, as it, from a veterinary dental standpoint, is that it's not cleaning up underneath the gum. So as veterinarians, most of most veterinarians will flip up the lip and look for tartar. Well, the teeth are clean, so your dog doesn't need a dentistry. So it doesn't get a dentistry for years because they're getting this done. And then what happens is the dog gets bad breath or tooth falls out or something bad happens. And then the client comes in and I take out all the teeth. Why? Because it's a cesspool up underneath the gums, but we have, but it looks good on the outside. So it gives a false sense of security to the client and the veterinarian. So these animals don't get treated. So again, Wasaba, it's right there in there. If you guys are fighting it, I don't know if you are, um, it's right there in the Wasaba dental guidelines that we, as a, as a guidelines committee, consider it an animal welfare concern. So it's a welfare committee. So we need to stop. Those are probably the last two things. And then the last thing I would say, um, and I know that in Denmark, you do have a dentist at the vet school now, which is great. Um, we have is, uh, two specialists now, actually, one in private practice and one yep. in... In, in vet school, yeah. Yeah, in the vet school. But you guys are actually teaching dentistry, which is phenomenal because in the US, there's only, I think, out of the 38 colleges in the US, I think there's only like six that have a dental program um, right now that have a dentist. I mean, some people teach it in community practice, but they don't actually have a dentist. So the other thing about the guidelines is that they talk about, um, you know, the university's role and trying to push it into um, being taught because that's really where dentistry is going to hit its stride is when we um, actually teach, teach it in school. Yeah. I, I, I'm, my education is uh, 10, 15 years old and we wasn't taught anything and there were, there were no specialists uh, yeah. at vet school at that time. So what I learned, I learned from one of the specialists on a, a private course, uh, mm -hmm. and it was uh, in three parts uh, with one day each, and there was a, yeah. a practical part as well. And it it really has done done wonders for my dental work. And and uh, it, it was so much fun afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, actually knowing what I was doing is fun. Who would have thought, but you're always uh, scared of, you're, you're scared of things that you don't understand. You're scared of the unknown. And, and that's, that's why I, you know, most of the people that, that I, most of the practitioners I know, what they'll tell students, you know, vet students that aren't getting stuff in vet school. Cause even like I had a, a in this class that I'm doing this weekend, we had a, 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 a person that just graduated from Davis. Davis has a, a, a actual dental program. They've had it for a long time. And she's just like, I didn't want to take it from them. And so I'm coming out here to do it. But if you don't have the opportunity in vet school, it should be the first thing that you do because most veterinarians have to do dentistry in the first week that they're out there. And that's why FACAVA um, is doing um, um, first day competency and dentistry is part of the first day competency. Um, and speaking of FACAVA, and this is going to launch. So look for this soon to come out. Um, Jersey and I and, and another veterinary dentist um, just put together some posters, some some uh, um, client educational posters. Um, and I know a lot of companies have client educational posters about dental disease, but they're branded and they're specific. I think these are like the top 10 dental problems. The fact that dental disease hurts. So all FICAVA members, this is coming very soon. It's going to come out on my Instagram or something pretty soon, um, but it's going to, uh, FICAVA is going to announce it. Um, but these posters are free. They're PDFs to be downloaded and you can print them 
and put them up in your in in your waiting room or in your in your thing. So that's another little bit of educational stuff that you guys are going to have fairly soon. So we also have to mention you know, where people can uh, learn more about mm-hmm. dentistry and learn more about you. So you mentioned courses and speaking and also your Instagram. So maybe you can list some of those. Of course, I would link to to most of it, but uh, maybe you you can list what you feel is yeah. important. Well, I mean, our website um, currently it's going to go through a, a an upgrade in the next few months, but it's 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 um it's just Dog Beach Bet. Dog Beach Vet. So it's like a dog at the beach as a vet. And it's just dogbeachvet.com. If you go on there and look under the the courses there is online and you know the virtual courses, that would be something that y'all could do um, you know, from from home uh, as opposed to coming here. We do, if you really want to get in my opinion, <laughs> the best training, <laughs> come to San Diego. Um, we do quarterly classes um, in, in uh, usually, you know, the middle of the quarter, like February, June, stuff like that. We do extractions, radiology, profi once a year, which is actually what we're doing today. So it's going to be a whole year before we do this. Um, we do a level two, which is periodontal surgery and restoratives, which I think GPs should be able to do. So that's something. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's all on our website. The other thing I would consider um, if you guys are really into dentistry and you want education, is um, the European Veterinary Dental Congress um, is in Krakow this year, um, and it is going to happen. It's April 7th through 9th. Um, I'm actually giving, I want to say, six or seven lectures there. Um, so if you're really interested in dentistry and you want to come see me in Europe, that's that's where I'll be in, in Europe this year. And then Wasava, WSAVA, next year, um, 2023, will be in Portugal. Um, so those are, the, and there'll be workshops at both of these places. Um, and that would be a, a really good opportunity. And like I said, I, I'm not, don't quote me, I think it's called IQ, I can I can send you the link, but it's, yes, it's the virtual please. course that the that the Danish group's doing, um, which should be phenomenal. And then, like I said, I think Jens is doing some courses, and um, that would be another option. Then, yeah, did you do? It was yours ESABS? Was that the course that you did, or did you go up to Accessia? No, I did Jens, Jens's course. Oh, Jens. Uh, okay. And uh, he, he's he's uh, since then he's uh, taking it, it back and doing it uh, privately in his own clinic. But he was partnering with one of the Danish uh, um, firms that deliver u- uh, utensils and and whatnot gotcha. so uh, but it it it's and of course the the course has uh, become better over the years but it's still i think a four or five part course where you go <laughs> through in in logical <laughs> steps and it can very yeah. highly highly recommend that as well yeah. I, and i would too i think i think anytime you can get hands-on training it's just there's there's no there's no um substitute for it Um, you know, we can talk about stuff all it's like I can tell you two finger pressure, I can tell you this angle, but until your hands are dirty, it 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 doesn't it doesn't click a lot of times. So Okay. Well, uh, Brooke, thank you very much for all your time and energy and uh, all your hard work. Um, I hope this uh, will uh, be just a, a little stone on the way for better wealth, uh, welfare for our pets. But uh, yeah, and well, that and the and the guidelines are free, so I'll, we, I'll get you that link, and you can just you know the, it's it's free, downloadable PDF for everyone to 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 read. And like I said, it's basically a, a mini textbook, and it works really well. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. You're very welcome. Take care. Have a good day. Husk, at du kan finde links og noter til dagens afsnit på sivp.dk og så episodens nummer, for eksempel sivp.dk-1. Og føler du et behov for at udvide dine faglige færdigheder, uden at skulle tage en hel dag væk fra familien og fra klinikken, så har jeg nogle online kurser til dig. Du har måske hørt mig sige det før, men du kan få en hel måneds gratis adgang. Og det kan du få med en speciel kode, som jeg ikke deler noget andet sted end her i podcasten. Og det er fordi, at dig, der lytter til podcast, du er noget helt særligt. På sivp.dk Skråstreg XYZ får du fire ugers gratis adgang til kurserne og protokollerne på hjemmesiden. Alle kurserne har specifikke læringsmål, så du ved præcist, hvad du får ud af den tid, du investerer i det. 
Du kan for eksempel lære at lave en regelret neurologisk undersøgelse og bruge det allerede næste gang, du er på klinikken. Du kan også lære at tolke blodprøver, og du kan lære at lave et godt finlåsaspirat og tolke det sikkert. Der er meget mere, men kig over på sivp.dk-xyz og tilmelde dig den gratis adgang, så kan du se, hvad du kan lære og bruge allerede næste gang, du er på klinikken. Udover alt det, så får du også adgang til et lukket online forum, hvor du trygt og sikkert kan dele alle dine i gås øjne dumme spørgsmål. Dem er der selvfølgelig ikke nogen af. Men vi er sammen om at lære. Du skal ikke lære alene. Vi er sammen om at blive bedre. Og så ved jeg godt, at der er nogen, der er bekymret for at tilmelde sig et medlemskab. De er måske bange for ikke at få det brugt. Og jeg ved godt, at dig, du som lytter, til det her jo går op i din faglige udvikling, for ellers havde du jo ikke lyttet til podcast. Men skulle du nu alligevel være bekymret for at glemme og melde dig fra, når din gratis måned udløber, så skriv lige til mig. Jeg har nemlig resultatgaranti, og det betyder, at hvis ikke du ser resultater i din hverdag, så skal du selvfølgelig ikke betale for noget for at have været på kursus hos mig. Se på sivp.dk-xyz for at tilmelde dig en gratis måned med det samme. Vi ses!